Looks like you've been missing a lot of work lately. I wouldn't say I've been missing it, Bob. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Deep. It's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I am exhausted from working two podcasts, but the show must go on. Today, we're talking work-life balance, unlocking your creativity, and reaching your biggest goals with author of The Elevation Approach, Tina Wells. In our headlines, one celebrity has good news about an accident recovery. What does it have to do with you? We'll share. And in our TikTok Minute, you'll have to decide, is it what you leave behind for your family or what you instill in them? Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Tyler, who has an amazing question you'll just have to hear. And finally, I'll share some joyful trivia. And now two guys who take the life out of work-life balance. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. I swear you were tempted to say, suck the life. Just, yeah. <laughs> work-life balance. Or just suck. I might have stopped right at suck. <laughs> just just end it right there hey everybody welcome to monday sit back and relax because we're gonna have some fun today we got a great show and every show begins with a guy across the card table from me mr og how are you buddy just uh, another glorious day here in the basement did you hear we had so much energy going into this show and he just brought us to a screeching halt and there it goes well the good news doug it takes me a while to warm up we've got Tina Wells here today, as you so eloquently said a few minutes ago. You know what we're going to do? We're going to uh, we're going to work on that work life balance. OG, maybe you could have a little bit more work in the work life balance this morning. I was like, that work life balance is great for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's got to be a work part. Oh, the work part. In our headline, I think we never reported on this headline, so can't wait to talk about this today. Well, let's get the machinery running. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. Our headline today comes to us from uh, CNN and the BBC. Do you guys remember uh, actor Jeremy Renner on New Year's Day had a horrible, Mm -hmm. horrible accident with a snowplow? Yeah. His own snowplow. Yeah, Jeremy learned that human versus snowplow, snowplow wins. Well, and to be fair, it wasn't a snowplow like... Yeah, like from the county offices. Yeah, Yeah. it was. I mean, this was a thing that they used to plow mountain roads. It was a a snow cat. It was a big monster. It's what like ski resorts would use to groom their trails. Yeah. And uh, also, from what I understand, he didn't put it in park. So, yeah, according to the BBC issue. Yeah. According to the BBC piece here, OG, he he was uh, helping his uh, nephew get the car unstuck out of the snow. Didn't put it in park. It started moving. He was trying to get in the driver's seat. And the snowplow ran him over. Ran him over. That's right. On New Year's Day. Uh, The piece from CNN, though, that caught my attention was this. And it was Jeremy Renner shows off strides in recovery on treadmill. Uh, Jeremy Renner's continuing on his road to recovery, taking his followers along with him. Mayor of Kingstown Star posted on the Insta Stories portion of his verified Instagram account over the weekend and shared a video in which he was doing physical therapy on an anti-gravity treadmill. Renner can be heard saying the machine allows him to only feel 40% of his weight while, while walking. And man, the pictures of him in uh, the hospital bed, he, he looks pretty torn up. But the, the, the reason why I bring this up, OG, is it is now, we're into April. And the guy's just beginning to be able to start putting some walking together again. How long do you think it's going to be until he actually gets to act? I, a couple of weeks. Seems like a, a while. Couple, a couple of weeks. Yeah. He's going to yeah. play the guy in the hospital in bed. Yeah, I got this part. <laughs> Depends on how they cast him. <laughs> Is he jumping off buildings like the Avengers? Probably not anytime soon. So the reason that I bring this up is because whenever we're looking at those uh, flexible benefits at work, when we're putting together our plan, oh, gee, disability, the one thing nobody wants to think about, right? I'm very safe. Things go great. Jeremy Renner. Yeah, I have an office job, so yeah. I have an office job. I'm not going to get hurt. I don't out there slinging bricks up a couple flights of stairs. I'm, I'm 
I just sit at my desk all day, so no big deal. I don't need it. Which one should people be focused more on, long-term or short-term? Because there's always those options when you're signing up for benefits. Well, if you've got a good you know, emergency fund, short-term is going to cover that component. Your emergency fund should cover that part of it. The, the bigger issue isn't the, hey, I'm out of work for a few weeks. The bigger issue is I'm out of work for months on end or Yeah, forever. who knows how so long it's going to take Jeremy Renner mm-hmm. to be able to act again. It could be a long, long time. Who knows if Jeremy Renner could ever actually act. What, you don't like Jeremy Renner as an actor? Is that what you're saying? Wow. No. I think he was fine. I'm like, too soon, man. <laughs> too soon. I don't know. His his little f- foray into the Bourne series didn't really get me excited. but No, but I can't see him in all of his different roles and still not think about the Hurt Locker. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I forgot about that movie. There's some stuff he did that are really good. That was a pretty good movie. Okay. I'll, I'll take back my Jeremy Renner can't act. Wow. Commentary. Jeremy, we got your back. Just yeah. Doug and I, Doug and I, I got your back. Hurt Locker. Yeah, good, good stuff. This is a reason, OG, that we want to have a discussion about risk management and not about buying insurances too. Because to your point, the way you answered Doug's question, if you just ask which insurance should I buy, it doesn't encompass an emergency fund. But once you get that emergency fund in place, that's a great way to cover a bunch of different risks. Maybe you can raise the deductible on your homeowners, raise the deductible on your car insurance don't need short-term disability, like your insurance costs can really go down by a bunch just by adding a little bit of money that the over-optimizers call inefficient use of money, right? Putting money in in that spot in case a snowplow yeah. hits you. In case a snowplow hits you. But, I mean, it's that or or any anything, right? I mean, hell, you could be playing basketball with your kids and tear a tendon and can't work for a period of time. I saw a video from CBS News that showed a Kia Soul going down the freeway next to uh, next this. to a truck. Did you see this with those with those huge yeah. tires? And one of the tires yeah. comes out, kicks off to the left, hits just the front quarter panel of the Soul. The Soul went airborne. Mm-hmm. I thought for sure yeah. somebody died. No injuries. Yeah, flipped and rolled. And then my favorite part of that whole thing was at the very end when the tire came down the road still and hit it one more time. <laughs> really? I didn't see that. Yeah. That very, like after, like it came off, it flipped it, it did all the stuff, the car comes to rest and then, you know, because the car behind it had a dash cam, right? So the car behind it stops and all of a sudden you just see da-doing, 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 and it hits it one more time. <laughs> it always amazed me when people said, Man, no, I'm really okay. safe. Yeah, when people yeah. said, no, I'm really safe, I'm really safe. OG could be driving down the road in his Kia Soul, as he does. As I do. And Doug, in his monster truck next to him, yep. doesn't have his tires on right. One kicks off, and although OG's very safe, I mean, there was no time for reaction. There was no, no time. No, the thing literally, he, like, he, they, were, they were parallel to one another driving down the highway. Like, literally, you know, like you said, it came off, and he ran it over and flipped the car. Could you imagine, though, you're like airborne upside down going, what the hell? What just happened? Like, how how am I upside down airborne at this very second? I was. I don't get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what a what a what a shock, because, you know, that's all in slow motion, right? Like, oh, yeah, like as it like when you know, when you have that crash or whatever, it's like how long is it? <laughs> five seconds, six seconds. But it, I bet it was as long as five, six seconds of that person's life. Yeah. Yeah. How did I get upside down? This is going to hurt. Yeah, but wait, wait, oh, hold boy. on. <clears throat> you got Wind River. You got the town. You got. Oh, here we go. A hawk. I mean, I haven't seen Wind River. This is a talented actor, and you're. I'm still stuck on this. The town, he, I think he got nominated as a best supporting actor for the town. Really? I didn't think it was that good of. I mean, that's not a. Not, I don't want to say it's not a good movie, but it's not a uh, acclaimed the town movie. Was, no, it wasn't a claim, but man, was that movie fun. Well, and it, I, yeah, it was fun. I bet, but his specifically, I'm, I'm nearly certain he got nominated for his role, the okay. acting in his role. Okay. But I, I just, I, I, I'm stuck I, I on you. Apologize. I don't have to apologize to you. I apologize to Jeremy Renner. Unless you are the leader of the Jeremy Renner fan club, in which I also will apologize to you. It was. Oh, gee, let's get back to disability insurance, if you guys don't mind. <laughs> Early time joke. How do we? How do we determine what the right amount of disability coverage is to get? As much as you can buy. Because I think we start there. We do not start with just get some 
is not the answer. Yeah. Like, how do I calculate the right amount? Get so well, I mean, quite quite literally, the most you can get, and I'd say that a little tongue in cheek, but the most you can get through work generally is sixty or sixty six percent of your salary. And when you kind of look at all the asterisks that go into, if you're talking about a group policy, if you look at all the asterisks, it generally only covers your base salary, does not count bonuses or stock option awards or RSU grants or any of that sort of stuff. So number one, if you have bonus income, stock income, you know, something like that, you're already kind of behind the eight ball, so to speak, when they calculate that 60%. The second thing is that if your employer pays for the vast majority of it, which they do almost uniformly, then the benefit that you receive is going to be taxable, just like, you know, any other earnings that you make, right? You get money, you pay taxes. And so you're 60% of that minus taxes. Where does that end up being in terms of a monthly income compared to what your take-home income is now? What we generally find for most people is that that number, the take-home that you get from work, if something bad happens, probably will put food on the table and shelter. Like it probably does those things. Maybe not to the extent that you're used to currently, but you know, if you have a professional job and you have 60% of your your income covered through disability and you got to pay some taxes and stuff like that, you will have enough money to put food on the table. What you generally won't have enough money for is all of the other financial stuff you want to accomplish. Because right now that's what you do with it, right? So you make, you know, you have a job that makes you $100,000 a year. You pay taxes, you pay you for mortgage and, and, and then what do you, you, you take a little bit and you save it in your 401k. You have a little bit and save it in your brokerage account. That extra is the stuff that's not going to be covered or that you'll have extra, you know, if you have an illness or an injury for an extended period of time. So you're not going to pay for your Lexus in the seasons of savings event. Correct. Yes. You will have enough money to have a vehicle, just not a Lexus, for example. So when I say as much as you can get, it's kind of sort of tongue in cheek, but the insurance company isn't going to let you get more than you can get. You can't say, my job pays me $100,000 a year. I would like $400,000 a year of disability coverage, please. Yeah. Oh, look, my leg. (laughs) Ah, ah, ah. (laughs) That doesn't work like that. So get as much as you can through work and then do the math on that and say, okay, if I'm making hundred grand and they're going to pay me sixty. dollars and now I got to pay some taxes on that. That gets me down to 48. You know, what? what is the plan? Like we talk about with life insurance, the answer isn't necessarily go buy more insurance. The answer is, what do we do? You want to have the plan on the shelf of what your life look like at $48,000 a year versus your $100,000 a year salary. And if you go, no, that's okay. I can, you know, I've got a spouse that works or I have expenses that I can cut or I'm financially independent and I don't need that extra savings then okay, great. Problem solved. You've developed a solution. But if you're young or if you're just starting your career and you go, well, I've got this job at 100, I'm counting on the fact that I can save $20,000 a year, $15,000 a year for the next 40 years of my life to retire. You better ensure your ability to save because, um, because the government and maybe your work will give you enough money to put food on the table. They'll handle that. It's the extra stuff that you need to account for. Yeah. You're, you still got to worry about what happens after 65. Yeah. Well, and that's the point, right? Like, so your group disability insurance will end at 60 or 65. Social security disability will end at 65 and turn into regular social security. Well, guess what? If you've been sick or hurt your whole life, you don't have any social security wages. So, you know, what's your social security going to look like? And if you haven't been able to save for a long time, your savings will be low. So, I like to think about your, you know, that individual disability component of your life of, of that's ensuring your ability to meet all of your financial goals because the government and your group plan will take care of your food. Like you'll have, you'll be fed. Maybe not to the extent that you want to be fed, but you'll, you'll have food. Just nothing extra. Let's transition into our TikTok minute. This is a segment of the show where we take a look through the eyes of a TikTok creator and ask the question, is this great advice? Is this tomfoolery? What exactly is it? Doug, which one do you think we're going to bring today? Gold. This is, I really actually think people are going to rewind and take notes on this one. Well, let's see. This is one that Janet sent to us. Let's listen to uh, what she's got. Some advice from Steve Harvey and the Steve Harvey show. 
told my kids the other day, I said, let me explain something to y'all. If something happened to me and mama, I want you all to understand, y'all gonna be around the casket crying because I'm not leaving you everything. <laughs> I'm just not. I'm going to spend 85% of my income on me and your mama. You're right. Yeah. You're right. You're right. I'm going to leave about 5-10%. That's it. The rest of the money, me and your mama going somewhere. We can, dad, me, me, we can't go on vacation. No. No, I want to be with just with your mother. It is not what you leave to them that makes them great. It's what you leave in them. If you leave more to them than you leave in them, they will run through everything you left to them. Yeah. But if you leave enough in them, you don't have to leave so much to them because they can go out there and make their own way in life. Cool. I'm glad you said that. For now. It, it is what you leave to them, what you leave in them. And it, it's funny because we keep having the discussion here, OG. People are like, I'm not leaving my kids any money. I think that um, this is all the better because they put the motivational symphony music behind the track. That's uh, that that totally makes this <laughs> legitimate <laughs> content. Yeah. 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 The dude's like, hey, how about if I rip off the Steve Harvey show, but I'm going to make it better. Mm. I'm going I'm I'm to ups- take the Steve Harvey show and I'm going to put uh unknown Super musical track behind it and uh, post it so it be- my question is is what happens hypothetically if let's say that i want to spend 110 percent of what i make on you and baby mama on me on me hmm. that's kind of my plan actually i mean leave the debt part to the kids leave that 10 yeah. percent part to the kids yeah yeah that's uh-huh. a different 10 percent that i'm leaving them but I think it would be every it is oh, impactful. Like it. They would remember me forever. They would like, oh, hey, <laughs> thanks, Dad. My dad would, God, oh, my dad, my old man. Especially your ten percent. The ten percent of your hundred and ten percent. That's going to be meaningful for the rest of your kids' lives. That's going to impact it will them. Be. Yeah, I mean, they, they will look upon me with reverence. Listen, we have all these people, OG, on the show. People need something for their memoir. Like some, yeah. something, something to really blame everything on, and it, how it, I why made not you millions of dollars and left my kids with tens of millions of debt by OG. I'm glad no, we I'm could kidding. take this serious subject and, uh, <laughs> and, and take it and wreck yeah. it. What I do like about this because we have the argument: leave your kids money, leave them not money. I do think OG. I I love the point there. It's what you teach them, and then yeah. leave them whatever. It's about how they're going to use it. Right. Everybody's like, I'm not leaving my kids anything because they're just going to mess it up. Well, if, if you don't teach them anything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like giving kids an allowance and then just handing them money and like, hey, you know, go <laughs> go play in the street with this money. Go take this money and blow it on. Yeah. You know, do it or whatever. You want. Right. Y- you have to parent. We'll dive deeper into that topic and also into disability insurances and risk management in general in our newsletter the 201 comes out the day after our monday wednesday shows always free subscribe by going to stackybenjamins.com slash 201 number 201 gets you there and you could dive deeper into any of the topics we talk about on today's show hey coming up next i'm super excited we finally get to talk to this woman tina wells has been one of essence's 40 under 40 She's the academic director for Wharton's Leadership in the Business World program at uh, Penn. And she's founder of Buzz Marketing Group, an agency she found at age 16. How do, you, how do you start an agency at age 16 with clients like Dell, Oprah Winfrey Show, nice. Kroger, Apple, PG, Johnson & Johnson, American Eagle? That's quite a, quite a list. But you know what? She's adding to a resume that she's now coming to the Stacking Benjamin Show, but not before. Doug gives her some time to come down the stairs and get seated at the table. Doug, you got some trivia for us? Darn right I do, Joe. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And man, I am beat. I've been announcing for Stacking Benjamins and Stacking Deeds has increased my workload 33%. Gracing the world with this velvet voice four hours a week, throwing off my work-life balance. I need to get back to my Zen place. Speaking of happy places, that brings me to my trivia. According to the latest World Happiness Report, yes, that's a real thing, 
There's a country that has held the title of happiest place on earth for six years in a row, beating out Denmark and Iceland again for the top spot. And they're so happy about their long-held title, they're now offering to fly 10 people to attend their happiness masterclass to teach others their art of being happy. So the question is, what country has been ranked the happiest for six years in a row? I'll be back right after I fill out my application for this master class of happiness thing. Because if anyone is in desperate need of that, I mean, this guy right here. Hey there, stackers. I'm work creator and jolly multiplier, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And I still can't believe Joe's got me doing double duty. Would they ask Michael Jordan to make 33% more shots or like Simone Biles to extend her floor routine by a third? I think not. Good thing Tina Wells is here to set Joe straight on work-life balance and get me back to my happy place. So what country has been beating the pants off others to be ranked the happiest place in the world for six years running? Duh, it's Finland. And now it's time to talk about unlocking your creative side to reach your goals and find work-life balance with Tina Wells. Well, if you've ever read Honest June, Mackenzie Blue, or The Z Files, you know our next guest, Tina Wells, joining us at the card table. How are you? Hi, Joe. I'm so happy to be at the card table. <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy you're here because... I mean, there's so much here to unpack, Tina, that I really want to talk to you about. I've got, you know, about 25 minutes to talk to you and probably six hours of questions. But I want to start with this cool thing at eight. I still can't get over as long as I've known your story that you started a business at age 16. And as I was diving into that, this all started with a job at the New York times. Like how do you get a job at the New York times at age 16? That's my biggest question. I've never heard answered. Well, first of all, it's the new girl times. So oh, the new the girl answer. times. <laughs> that's the answer you've been looking for. Which <laughs> was a newspaper for girls out of New York city. <laughs> that part is accurate. And you know, the story I answered an ad in the back of 17 magazine back in 1995. And that was the start of a career. I never even thought I was starting, right? I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be a fashion writer. So the new girl times felt like a really good way to get there. And instead it led me to a career in marketing and market research and something I love for over 20 years. And so now you have the answer to your burning question. <laughs> it's new girl times, new not girl New York times. times. Yes. It's, it's funny because I probably even read new girl times, Tina, five different places. And I still in my head went New York times. But I mean, good, good marketing name for them, right? That they knew people were going to do that. Well, it's still led, I bet, to a ton of New York times mentions because you grew this thing. So there's one thing to start this thing that you're passionate about, right? I mean, you like reviewing products and helping girls at the time, but mm -hmm. how do you grow that into a fully fledged business? You know, I think there's a common thread throughout my career, which is this idea of being at the right place at the right time, you know, and understanding where culture was moving. And so if you think back to where we were in the late nineties, the biggest thing that was emerging was this new teen explosion in music, right? So Backstreet Boys, Britney Spears, NSYNC, and then you move into the early 2000s, you have teen people, teen Vogue, L Girl, all of these like teen, you know, Aeropostale explodes, Abercrombie explodes, right? And so I kind of rode that teen wave. And then what starts to happen in the early 2000s? Everyone starts to talk about this new customer called a millennial, right? And all the teenagers I had been studying for the last decade graduated from college, grew up, and became millennials, the largest demographic in history at the time. And so I happened to be at the right place at the right time when a few people, right, who understood them because when they were, when it was youth marketing, it was a niche thing. Then when all of these people became adults and we realized we really have to know how to talk to them, I was positioned at the right place, became known as the millennial whisperer. But it was not <laughs> anything I could have predicted in that way. I think it was really just being in the right place at the right time. Well, I think it's one thing to be there. It's another thing to recognize that you're there. Then that's a whole different interview, by the way, because I want to now fast forward. You've had this business for 11 years. As we said, when we introduced you, you're working with some of the biggest brands on earth. But tell me about you at age 27. What did that look like? 
Yeah, so by 27, you're right, 11 years into business. I, you know, at 25, I had a cover story with Oprah's Magazine, which was a game changer for me at the time. And I just go into this work mode, right? I'm super grateful for my career at this point. And all I want to do is like crush everything, right? It was the hustle time. I had an office in New York City. And what I didn't realize was that I was heading toward my first burnout. You know, I didn't even know or have the language for that at that age. I just thought you leave college, you work really hard, and you continue to scale and build, you know? And so... Uh, yeah, you're right. 11 years into it, it was my first burnout. I didn't know what to do. And I, I was very fortunate to have a friend who said, you need to come on a vacation and your laptop's not invited. And this is funny because for a lot of people that are listening, they might not like their job. You hear these statistics, Tina, that 70% of people don't like their job and they're suffering from burnout. In fact, you cite this in your work in a 2022 Gallup poll, more than 12,000 workers, they found that about 76% of workers report experiencing some sort of burnout on the job, but it's not just people that dislike their job. They dislike what they do for you. I mean, you're passionate. You, you loved what you do. It sounded like. I did. I've always been very fortunate to love the work that I was doing, but I was often accused by my friends and family and very rightfully so of just working all the time. Like my job was really discovering culture, explaining culture. It was a really fun, fascinating job. And it was something I could actually do every day, all day, right? I could sit down at night and watch TV to disconnect and still, quote unquote, be doing my job, you know? And so- <laughs> Figuring out how to create work-life harmony is a lifelong assignment for me. And I think often you hear of, of writers writing the books that they need. I definitely need this book. You know, I definitely expect that there are going to be readers who can live <laughs> the elevation approach better than me, right? They're going to be giving me tips on my own approach. But I write and I use these tools every single day. Well, speaking of the tools, let's get into it. Was it at 27? Was it on that vacation that you began dreaming up the elevation approach? I think what I really talk about is it took me, I would say, even after the first time of understanding I needed a new way, it took me about another 12 years in business to really perfect it. I would say the last two to three years, I've really gotten a rhythm um, around it, but it really took, like I discovered that I needed to add recreation, right? So I, I explained there are four phases in the elevation approach, preparation, inspiration, recreation, and transformation. I think I spent the first 11 years of my career in preparation and inspiration, right? So I come up with a big idea, do the work behind it, get super inspired and just stay in this loop, right? And I was never bringing things fully to the transformation phase or to life and I couldn't understand why. And when I started to bring recreation, that was a game changer. But then all I did was use it as a way to do more of the first two phases, right? So it really just was like, Oh, I'm working out. Well, working out isn't really recreation, right? That probably for me, it belongs in preparation. And so I was doing things that I thought were relieving stress and doing what I needed to do. And it just wasn't working. So it took me a long time to figure that piece out. Well, let's walk into how this is different than work-life balance, because you draw a clear distinction early on, Tina, that this is not about work-life balance. It seems to me you really have a problem with this word balance. What's funny is, is you're not the only one that has a problem with the work-life balance. I was watching a TikTok video literally this morning before we recorded, and there was some, some guy, you know, from hustle culture, right? And I think what you're talking about is the anti-hustle culture, but he's talking to this audience, Tina, and he's going, Steve Jobs didn't have work-life balance. Beyonce doesn't have work-life balance. Like work-life balance is for them. Your job is to get out there and hustle and get it. I think you agree with balance is the problem, but maybe not with the rest of that. No, I think we all realized, maybe even during the pandemic, that the way we were working wasn't working for us, right? And so even though there was a lot of anxiety during the pandemic, there were a lot of things that kind of drove us a little bit crazy. One of the things I think we started to enjoy was how we could work and then see our families, right? So we could go on Zoom, we could do the recordings and then go have lunch together, right? So there became this idea of like, wow, there's a different way that we can live. I think there are several people who have been talking about work-life harmony. You know, I think Jeff Bezos famously gave a talk about work-life harmony. Um, and for me, when, when you say balance, if you think about a scale, what that ultimately means is if you have a ton of work, let's say you're in a season where, you know, you're in the final months of your PhD or, you know, you're 
working on an end of quarter review. There is ultimately going to be more work on that scale. To balance it, that means you instantly have to add more life on that scale, right? And then you just keep doing these two things. And what happens? You've just got a ton of things on your scale. So the goal isn't to keep adding more until everything's balanced, right? Sometimes you need a lot less of everything. But what you really want and what Harmony speaks to is that it's almost like a plate, right? It's like building the perfect meal. Only you know that recipe for you and your life and all the flavors, all the things on that plate work together, right? So you're not overloading the plate. It's it's exactly what you want on that plate, but it's also crafted in a way that makes the most sense for you. So for some of us, it could mean that you're working a lot, but that your plate has all the other things that, that you need to feel whole, whatever that means, right? And so you add in just the right amount of recreation and and all of that is to fuel your productivity in the way that feels healthy for you, right? Where it's not overload. And I have to be honest and say, when I started to incorporate recreation, you know, in my mind, I was like, ah, but I'm, I'm wasting time. I should be doing the work. And I right. might come out yeah. of a, like just a walk just to enjoy a really nice sunny day and didn't even realize I was processing a problem or something that ir- – not even a problem. Maybe you just had something – an irritating meeting at work or an irritating phone call. And that 15 minutes of disconnecting, you're like, I don't know what, what I was upset about but I'm not anymore, right? That your body just kind of worked through it. And so when I realized it actually helped with productivity, which is kind of a, you know, I want you to have- It feels like a paradox. It feels like a paradox. Yeah, I I agree. And I think I do sometimes struggle with the idea of recreation, especially in a time when you feel like I should be hustling, like you were just speaking to that podcast, right? I should be hustling it out. And it's like, even in those moments, where can you carve out an hour, 15 minutes, some time for yourself to really recalibrate and stay very focused on the goal, but do it in a way that you're not, you know, out of breath, out of energy, out of everything when you get to that finish line. I got the feeling as I was reading through the elevation approach, Tina, that this is, you know, a lot of people want to manage their calendar. They want to manage their time. This is really much more about managing your energy. It felt like, like you're not, you're not doing recreation because you deserve it or because it's some sort of ice cream treat. You're doing it because if you don't do it, everything comes out worse. Yeah, that's true. I think that's an incredibly good point. It is not this reward system. It's saying I am doing this so I can stay in harmony. So I'm not burnout out when I get to transformation in what I want, right? Like the goal is to have enough, right? Have the things you want, but also be healthy enough to enjoy them. Because how many times do we hear about people getting the thing that they want and not finding any joy in it, right? So one of the overarching themes is creating joy. And I, I want to dive into especially the first piece, preparation, and then if people want to dive in more, we'll let them do that on their own. But how is your day change. So I live my day as the elevation approach, right? So my mornings are spent in preparation and that's, we know like the instant elevations in those phases are uh, that phase around decluttering your space, getting curious, knowing your numbers, right? So I love consuming articles, research, news briefings, emails, getting in touch with my team all in the first part of my day. And then the second part of my day is when I love to take my meetings, right? That's when I'm, inspiration is about being out and about. Um, That's when I really feel like the most on at that part of my day. And then um, recreation comes for me as an afternoon break that I really need. Because even taking a little time to go grab tea, take a walk, it's a sunny day today, like just getting out allows me to come back and then tie my day together. You know, and so for me, working out is preparation. It's not recreation, right? If I do something in recreation, it's it would be like a slow flow or something that really is more of like moving my body in a way that just feels nice, not like crush it in the morning, you know, in preparation, <laughs> you're like, I'm ready to crush the day. That is not the feeling at recreation. But, you know, in my business these days, I spend a lot of time working um, with teams in Asia. So I need that recreation at that point, because then transformation helps me really tie the day together at the end of the day. Let's talk about recreation for a second, because a lot of people that are listening to this work for somebody else. They're not in complete control of their calendar. So how do we start taking control and using the elevation approach if I work for somebody else? Yeah, so I think the first part of that is the language. You know, when I had my agency, I worked for a lot of other people, right? And and, and so imagine going to clients and saying, 
I'm going to just block off half my week. And the way I phrased it was, you know, I prefer if we want to set a standing meeting or call to do it Tuesday or Thursday. Um, you know, Wednesdays were the day I was normally in person with anyone. So I can meet you in person on Wednesdays. And I like to spend my Mondays and Fridays in strategy because I really want to be thoughtful about your work. And the response, I couldn't believe it was, wow, you have two days on your calendar where you think about me. And, and so I love that idea that you are really doing the work, right? So I think it's explaining the process. So I think it's all in how you say it. You know, you certainly can't say, I need me time, right? But instead, right. it's like, you know, that doesn't work. But if you're like, <laughs> if you can let me have this day or this time to do this, I can be so much more productive in this other, you know, these other times, I'm going to be so focused on what I need to do, or I'm going to be better serving you. I'm not going to be burnt out doing the work. Let's try it for a week or two. If it doesn't work for you, can we revisit that, right? So I think it's all in how you phrase it, but you certainly can't go in and say, I need me time. How do I put that on my calendar? So as I hope all of our stackers are hearing, this all begins really with your goals. I th you point out very strongly that you really have to know what you're after, which fuels you. And for somebody who's worked a career, Tina, of fulfilling everybody else's dreams, that might be a little difficult. How do we begin choosing these, these correct goals and make them actionable and usable? Yeah. And I, I, again, you bring out a great point with the book, which is I am asking you to really get to know you right? Because I can't explain for you what work-life harmony means. You have to figure that out, which means you have to know what you want. And I also think it's really important to release yourself from goals or ambitions you might have had that served you for the last 15, however many years of your life. If those things have changed post-pandemic, I also think it's an invitation to be honest about that, to be honest that you want something new, and then to really get clear about how you're going to get it. But it's hard, you know, to set goal setting and you're you're trapped with old goals or you're not aware of how things are changing. And so it is really a deep dive into who you are right now at, at this stage, given all that we've all collectively been through. I think it's a good time to take a pause and say, hey, the things I wanted before, are they still the things I want right now? I'm going to get on my pedestal for just a second with our community, because if you just listened to what Tina said and you glossed over it, this is when we talk about retirement planning back when I was a financial planner, it's the part that so many people go, yeah, yeah, I don't really care about that. Let's just talk about the funds. Let's talk about the money. Let's talk about the, every study shows that if you don't have these concrete goals of what you want, you're not going to live as long. You're not going to be as healthy. You're not going to achieve as much. There's just so, there's so much there, Tina. And yet there's this portion of our audience that I always have trouble getting through to. They're like, no, no, no. I want to talk about how mutual fund works. It does. It it truly doesn't matter if we don't get this piece. You have these four phases that you mentioned earlier: preparation, inspiration, recreation, and transformation. Which phase we start with? You said you can start wherever you want, but let's just go into preparation. The first one you started with your health. Yeah. So, how did you use the preparation phase then, just as an example, to get moving on health and wellness? Uh, yeah. So one of the key principles of instant elevation is this idea of knowing your numbers. I'll give you one number. Um, my sleep score, right? I wear this aura ring every day um, for accountability around sleep because one of the things we like to tell ourselves is, I got enough sleep. I was fine. I feel fine, right? And when you have to deal with like a readiness score every morning, I feel like I wake up and get graded instantly, right? And so then I really was able to see, oh, I wasn't getting enough sleep. I got to do more research about what do I need to do to be in a better zone and then start correcting that so I could be way more productive, you know, in the time I wasn't sleeping. And so if I didn't have to deal with that number every day, I could lie to myself, right? And say, I feel good. Oh. It's just the time. Oh, you know, I'll get better next week. But instead, I'm like, if I am not hitting my goal, I feel it instantly. I'm very connected to that. And I'm like, no, I have got to do what I got to do to make sure I'm getting that sleep. And I think there are lots of numbers. You know, I also talk about tracking A1C and getting with doctors. You know, now I think this is a practice for many different doctors to help you with a lot of different numbers to understand just how you work and what you need more of. But that was a huge learning curve for me once I started understanding those numbers and how they work together and how they keep me really as productive as possible. It became a piece of data that I just had to always have access to. Yeah, preparation of data. Frankly, I was surprised to see it in the book, which I don't know why, because as I was reading your words, Tina, I realized that as I'm presented with data, like as you're presenting yourself with your sleep data, you're learning so much about yourself, which makes you 
this, your consciousness level toward this goal goes through the roof then. Yes. And that's a, also a great point, right? It keeps you in touch with what you want. And so we're all wearing these devices. We've got our Apple watches and trackers and we're, we're all do, we're, we're counting steps, right? That's a really important marker. How much are you moving, right? We could have some days where we're like, why don't I feel great right now? And it's like, oh, because I'm used to moving X amount of steps per day. And the last couple of days, it's been less. Like that does affect how you feel, right? Where your body gets used to a certain kind of rhythm. And so, Again, it's it's just being conscious of saying, I want to do more of something, and it keeps you accountable to whatever that is. You know, if it's, I want to cook dinner with my family, okay, how are you tracking that? Easily on your calendar, a few X's when you have dinner at, at home as a family, and you look at the end of the week and say, oh, I wanted it to be four nights, and it was two, and what happened, right? You're just asking yourself more questions. Maybe it was unavoidable to only, you know, have two, but at least you're having the discussion and you're not four months down the line saying, why do I feel this disconnection? It's like immediately in the moment, you know, what's caused it and how to fix it. You talk about to that point, all kinds of different types of preparation that you do. Uh, mental prep you begin with, what, what does mental prep mean? Oh, goodness. Um, there's so many different versions depending on what, which stage you're at. I think for me that the biggest piece of mental preparation might be the idea of decluttering my space, right? And what that mm. looks like for all of us. And we had an expert weigh into this chapter, and there are actually experts who weigh in on every single principle of instant elevation. And Michelle Morris, who has been a cleaning expert for 20 plus years, talked about the idea of like landing zones and identifying what they are in every room. And, and she made this and she's like, I'm, I'm surprised how, how so many people pile things on their desk instead of like making that a, like a no-fly zone and having drawers or other things so that your eyes immediately see like a clean slate, right? And so for me, though, that's one of them, but mine is more my inbox, right? I need to have a process around really getting my inbox down because if I have a cluttered inbox, it makes it hard for me to like get moving, right? And I find the same thing if I'm cooking in the in the kitchen. I have to make sure like all the dishes like are either put away or have a process so I'm not starting with like a sink full of dishes because for some reason I can't start the cooking process if my surfaces don't feel like prepped and ready to go, right? You'll start to discover what those things are for you. But I think when you look at decluttering, you know, you'll start to de develop some habits that are just your habits there. And then, and then physical preparation is next. I'm assuming that is your workout. That's your workout routine, your health and wellness routine. It is, but I'll give you one other little secret. I started years ago. I, I have this ballet rack in my room for dressing where I actually prep clothes like a week in advance if I can. So it, I don't use a lot. Like, I, I mean, the Sunday night for the following week, right? I'll take 30 minutes and say, what, what's on my calendar, here's everything. So I don't waste time in the morning when, to be honest, I'm not as caffeinated as I'd like to be trying <laughs> to make a decision on what to wear, right? I like to do it when I'm like in my Sunday fun day. It's like I can, can try things on. Like that just became something I like to do because like, I don't know, I wake up and I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I putting on? Like I like to have that sorted out for the week. So that actually is a prep tool that's really helped me. That's fabulous. Uh, my favorite on the list being a financial podcast, Tina, financial prep you had on here. So I'm high-fiving you. Yes. I mean, I think, again, knowing your numbers and it's about being honest with yourself, right? So if you have goals, if you have money you need to save, think like you have to be aware. I have like weekend money rituals that are fun, right? That are around like looking at different things. You know, one of the things I did this fall, right, in my day-to-day -day rituals or like my mon you know my mundane money ritual was looking at APR and I was like what in the world happened right you hear all these things right that interest rates are all and then all of a sudden when you sit down and do your ritual you're like excuse me this didn't look like this right and so it was a really funny thing I'm like obviously I've been hearing about this but incorporating that into a ritual and then having to deal with the reality made some other things it's like holiday season's going to look a little bit different right so I think those things are are really important you just took this idea of prep which everybody is the first of four and you turn it from this thing that sounds oh you mean I got to declutter I got to work on my calendar I got to and just took it Tina and made it super fun like preparation sounds badass it sounds like a great time 
It's fun and also my favorite thing to do. I love chiclet. I love thrillers. Uh, I'm a huge audiobook fan. Is I will put an audiobook on while I'm like prepping things for the week and doing it while I'm cleaning. I will put an audiobook on a podcast that I want to listen to. And that is, you know, you made an earlier point about what if you don't control your calendar? How do you add any of this into your life? And I think, you know, how do you own your commute? How do you own even five to 15 minutes of your day to infuse something you like to do, right? So laundry, for those of us who don't like laundry, laundry is a lot more fun when you can listen to a podcast or you can watch something, you know? So it's just finding those moments of infusing more of what you like into your day or into what we might call a very mundane activity. The book is The Elevation Approach, Harness the Power of Work-Life Harmony. Guys, not work-life balance, but work-life harmony to unlock your creativity, cultivate joy, and reach your biggest goals. And I believe it's available everywhere, Tina. Everywhere books are sold, yes. Tina Wells, thank you so much for joining us and helping our stackers get elevated. I super appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. I'm Rocky Lalvani, the Profit Answer Man. And when I'm not helping small businesses stack Benjamins for themselves, I'm stacking Benjamins for myself. Thank you to Tina for stopping by. Wow, OG, what a dynamo. You can have work and life, it turns out. Work and life, yeah. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, OG, they put what you value first. Uh, yeah, I, I got to get back in my golf game, honestly. I would value some range time, I think. Short game practice, that sort of stuff. It's funny you say that because I value Doug maybe getting worse at his online golf game. This dude, we're trying to play this online golf league, OG, you and me and Doug and a few other people. And and what the hell? Oh, Doug? I got yeah. skills. Scales. Yeah. It's with your four hour a week workload that you talked about during your during your trivia leaves you a lot of time apparently to practice the virtual links on the Xbox. So I'm gathering that you went to play this week's tournament and spotted me at the top of the leaderboard and went, oh, what's the point? Don't want to talk about it. Don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it it's your loved ones in your time. And I love Doug a little bit less every week when he kicks my butt <laughs> at that. That's why they made buying quality term life insurance. It's actually simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life now for a free quote. Haven Life, they're committed to offering a modern way to buy life insurance. They've shortened the application. They made it really simple. It's all online. You get an instant coverage decision, affordable prices, and of course, all policies issued by the parent company, Mass Mutual, more than a 160-year-old insurer. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to Tyler. Say hey, Tyler. Hey, G and old Joe. Uh, I got a question about how I should distribute my monthly savings contributions. Uh, due to a screw-up from our payroll specialist at work that I don't have the time or energy to explain, I'm due to receive about a 10% pay cut from the original salary that I've been receiving for about seven months now. Uh, My wife and I are both in our upper 30s, currently contribute about $500 a month to our Roth IRAs and about $400 a month to an HSA. We have three kids that are under eight years old and don't plan to have more. Both of our Roths are at about $30,000 each, so not great, but we're getting off to the best start we can. And our HSA is only at about $7,000 total right now. Uh, We don't draw from the HSA unless there's a major expense that happens unexpectedly. My question is, should I prioritize saving into one type of account over another, or should I just cut all three equally? Unfortunately, we're probably going to have to cut our savings in half to about seven or $800 a month from the 14 to 1500 that we were putting away before. Um, let me know what you think. T-shirt size is extra medium, and I'd like a whole cut in the belly button for ventilation purposes. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, t- <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. That's pretty good. Got to let that belly button breathe, though, Jay. Got to let it breathe. It's like fine wine. Yeah. He's all he's all set to be the person everybody stares at when you go to the theme park. Oh, could you imagine getting that phone call? It's like an ejection port for the belly button lint, too. Just gives it a, a direct exit. Exit. How about yeah. the phone call from payroll? We need to see you down in payroll. You're like, oh, man. You go down there like, listen, we screwed up. Um, and you're getting a pay cut. Be like, what? False. <laughs> How about no? 
How about I'm going to find a new job? Sounds like the problem is yours, not mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Sounds like you messed up. But you know what is great is that, and this is this is great about planning, OG, the fact that Tyler can still save a nice sum of money, even with this setback, shows the power of knowing where your money goes and doing some planning. Yeah. You know, the order of operations is making sure that you've got a emergency fund that's on track or, you know, fully funded. A number one. Uh, beyond that, between, you know, if we're talking about, you know, should I contribute to my workplace plan or my Roth or my HSA or my brokerage account, the order that we'd like to go through is 401k contributions to whatever the company match is going to be. So get all the free money that you can get. That can be Roth 401k or traditional, depending on, you know, whether or not you have that and, you know, your tax rates and that sort of thing. And then secondly, uh, or thirdly, I should say after that, then go back to the Roth and fill it up and then the HSA. So I would cut from the HSA in order to maximize mine and my spouse's Roth, assuming that the 401k is, con you know, you're contributing to your 401k to get all the free money that you can, if that's an option. I didn't hear him say that, but maybe yeah. that's there too. So we love the HSA from, a, you know, that kind of complicated tax-free status and like all the bells and whistles that come with that. But money is money, right? So if you've got two million bucks in your Roth, you're probably okay with some healthcare expenses also. You don't need the, the tax-free nature of the HSA. You could just take the money out of the Roth and pay your healthcare expenses in retirement. So that also helps with simplicity. It's another wonderful point, though, is that, you know, we glowingly talk about the HSA all the time. And yet you can get to where you want to go without an HSA. You can get there. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely an extra place. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, it's another bucket that you can work on, which is fantastic. And, and it serves a purpose in the short and intermediate term also. And like you said, if I have some, some expenses and maybe a, an addendum, you know, asterisk to that is if you do find your HSA is kind of dwindling, you know, you have a couple of those those expenses that are out of pocket that you're kind of whittling through, then, you know, you can always change it back, right? And say, okay, well, we need to start building that bucket back up again. I mean, you could have some, some sickness or injury or something like that, that causes a pretty big check to be withdrawn from the HSA, which is the purpose of it. You know, that's what it's there for. So keep an eye on that. But I like 401k, cash 401k, Roth in that order. Thanks for the question, Tyler. If you've got a question like Tyler has and you want to be able to customize your own T-shirt when we send one to you for being brave enough to call into the show, head to stackybedjamins.com slash voicemail. That's stackybedjamins.com slash voicemail and uh, leave, a, leave your question on the Haven Lifeline. The other thing that I would say about this uh, paycheck issue, this definitely warrants a conversation with your you know, boss's boss. And just something along the lines of, it's really not my fault that you guys did this. <laughs> and, and now we've become accustomed to this level of, of income. I wouldn't get into the fact that you're, you know, you guys are really cutting into my retirement savings. But, you know, for the last, whatever he said, five or seven months or something, we've been receiving this income. I understand that it was an error, but use it as an opportunity. You could use it as an opportunity to find out what you have to do to get that income back. Obviously, you had to make a change and uh, so be it. But what do I have to do? <laughs> you know, what do you need to see for me to get so I can get that money? Like, what do I have to sell more cars? Do I have to get more parts on? Do I, you know, what do you, what do you want me to do to prove to you that I'm worth that extra compensation that, um, that you were paying me and now, now you can't use it as an opportunity to kind of write your own ticket, basically? Thanks for that question, Tyler. Great question. And I like the order of operation. OG and thinking about it that way versus just spreading it around much, much, much more effective approach. That's going to do for today. Let's take a look at the community calendar, man. We ha always have a lot of good stuff going on in the basement. We are on uh, different social media pages. We have a great YouTube channel with helpful videos that are not part of the show. You can also watch segments of the show if you like that. StackyBedjamins.com slash welcome shows you all the places where we are helping you do better with your money. If you're not here, though, to just go watch some videos of us or to follow us on Instagram or whatever, you're more concerned about the market 
and uh, really what's going on maybe in the horizon. OG and his team have put together a free guide that shares eight moves to make in a down market. Guide will help you plan more and panic less no matter what the market does. So head over to stackingbenjamins.com slash guide. That's stackingbenjamins.com slash guide to get this helpful free guide from OG. All right. That is uh, how to find us in the community and how to stop worrying and start planning. Doug, you got it from here, man. Wrap it up for us. What should we have learned? Well, Joe, first, take some advice from our guest, Tina Wells, and use preparation, inspiration, recreation, transformation, all the shuns to reach your goal. Second, how about our TikTok Minute and Steve Harvey? Think about teaching your kids instead of just leaving them an inheritance. But the big lesson? <sighs> Don't brag about your secret happy place being at a spa. Some people might get jealous and call the cops. Thanks to Tina Wells for joining us today. You'll find her new book, The Elevation Approach, Harness the Power of Work-Life Harmony to Unlock Your Creativity, Cultivate Joy, and Reach Your Biggest Goals wherever you buy those paper things with nice cover art. You know what? We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com because, you know, that's just how we roll. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Lacey Langford, who's also the host of the Military Money Show, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Yunkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. So you were saying that some of those progressive commercials don't become your parents at those at home, Doug? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've had long, hard thoughts about I think them. about that, OG, every time Doug talks, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> every time Doug talks, I think, here we go. Doug's already becoming his parents. But look, at when someone is doing their job Cleaning well. Cleaning your trash cans, huh? No, 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 no. That's Don't be crazy. Why? I do have lots <laughs> he on goes, them, though. He goes, why? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's like, oh, your name and your phone number's on here. Never be too safe. He's like, with trash? If you watch some of those commercials, there are like hidden details that are really good that they don't sometimes never bring up. In that, like, that guy's got both a pager and a phone on his belt. He's wearing jean shorts. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. they bury some stuff in there that are really good. But uh, the one that I took offense to, because I believe when people are doing a good job that they need to be complimented, is when the guy's in the grocery store and he sees the manager and he goes, Hey, Steven over in produce, he's doing a heck of a job. <laughs> and I, I'm like, mother, boy, I do that a lot. Don't look at the hedges.
Nope, nobody's looking at your head. <laughs> Let's listen to the elevator one. To you, it may just be an elevator. Here goes nothing. But for a young homeowner becoming their parents, it's a learning opportunity. Come on in. <laughs> the more the merrier. Paris, huh? <laughs> Bonjour. We got any out-of-towners in the elevator? Tom, it is not easy. Tenth floor, huh? Must be a heck of a view. Okay. See how everyone else is facing this way? Progressive can't save you from becoming your parents, <laughs> but we can save you money. And then he says, let's run it again. All right, we got to do this again. <laughs> let's run it again. Bonjour. 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 Almost as good as the Allstate uh, Mayhem commercials. Oh, I think they far exceed the Mayhem. I mean, I like the Mayhem commercials, and I love that actor guy, but I think the the Don't Become Your Parents is way better. I like the SNL skit about Jake from State Farm where he, he dude comes home from work, and Jake from State Farm is there, and he's helping him with their insurance. And then he comes home the next day and Jake from State Farm's there with his wife again. Oh. And then he goes to like the neighborhood cookout and his whole family's there, including Jake from State Farm. Jake's got his arm around his wife. <laughs> Don't they go away for the weekend or something like that? Yeah. I, haven't, I haven't seen that one. It's clever. 